Hello everyone, this is Dr. Shi Jun Wang. In today's video, I am going to start a new series of classical sonatas where I will be teaching um, sonatas by Beethoven, Mozart, and Haydn. Um, I will pick one from each composer's most famous sonatas um, to, to uh, finish this series. Uh, I am going to do the Grand Pathetic Sonata by Beethoven and then the Cushion Number K332, uh, the F Major Sonata by uh, Mozart and also um, the last sonata, the E Flat Major Sonata by Joseph Haydn. Um, and so far, uh, my channel has been blessed with um, people, music lovers and I think many uh, amateur and professional uh, pianists with your great feedback, good comments. Um, I, I feel really, really lucky that I started uh, doing this and start to create this channel um, because of the pandemic. And there is hope. Um, I think um, the vaccine will, will really eventually help us to conquer this thing. Um, and. and Many people have been asking me, will I take the vaccine when it's available uh, to me? And I think um, after all the health professionals, um, I think as a teacher, um, probably I will be um, vaccinated um, in the early spring, I, I think. Um, the answer is yes. And we know uh, that the uh, research time has been such a, sh probably the shortest, in, in the human history for any vaccine to be approved. Um, but I think it's a, it's a duty. I think it's, uh, it has to be enough people to get vaccinated to prevent the spread. So even if there are like a really, really minor, very small number of people who might be allergic, and, and even that, the reaction is probably not uh, the most severe. So I will take the vaccine and hopefully 2021, our life will be back to normal. Okay, um, the reason why I have started with Chopin Etudes and then the Brahms Paganini variations, um, you might think of me as maybe a technical uh, <laughs> a geek, right? I, I focus on uh, piano techniques, I, I pick the hardest sets, the hardest pieces, um, it's really not the case. Um, if you ask any of my college students, we really spend a really minor amount of time on uh, Chopin etudes. We talk about pieces, uh, Chopin, Brahms, like ballads, sonata, we do classical sonatas, Bach, dances, and well tempo clavier all the time. Um, and, and why so much technical stuff? Because those are the easiest to teach on my own, right? I'm basically here teaching a piano class, a piano lesson without a student. Um, so a, a majority of the things I talk about, I have to assume, okay, this might be a problem, this might be a challenge. And for Chopin etudes, those are so obvious, right? Everyone knows what's difficult about that. And then I find solutions where I share with you, how did I learn those? How did I solve? The puzzle. But here, now that we're moving on to the great Beethoven, um, and there will be, uh, I think, I'm learning the four Chopin ballads, and I'm also thinking of the transcendental etudes and practicing the Fafale, the, the, uh, the hardest one. Um, I think that it, now it really requires me to um, really guess more and more accurately. Um, because not only we have technical uh, problems that need solution, we have many, many musical aspects, way more than the etudes. Um, and here, uh, the aesthetics of, or my taste uh, was built over the past 30 years by my piano professors, by my close circle of friends of musicians, by the CDs I listened to, by the concert that I attended, and, and of course, um, 
I can't say my taste is the best. Um, and, and the taste varies from musician to musicians. So probably we will, I will have more and more thumb downs and, and arguments, and that is okay. Um, because please remember, um, not everything um, where, where everyone's taste then you can convince everyone else and and we always have different ideas of of things and that's the beauty of this business of, of this um, expression musical expression uh, it, it always has arguments over so i will try to review all of my ideas as objectively as possible and please um, leave comments, please start healthy conversations. Um, uh, if, if you want to make uh, different uh, comments, please feel free to do so. But I still think majority of what I will talk about um, will be um, right and wrongs. Yeah, I will tell you when it's my own idea um, that you do need to follow. Okay. Um, first of all, the Grand Pathetic Sonata, for years people thought, oh, this must be a really, really sad sonata. Um, pathetic, right? It's, it's really not the case. Um, the, the very root of the word really means this emotion. So this is a piece with lots of emotion, um, almost like the Appassionata, right? I think this is a smaller uh, in terms of the length of the range, this is a smaller version of a passionata. So it's a lot of passion, a lot of emotions. Um, maybe there are um, moments that it's sad, but it's not throughout the piece. Okay. The very, very beginning of, of this piece, the first 10 measures, very unique writing. Um, Mozart never done that, Haydn never had anything like this, even the first seven sonatas never had a slow moment, like a slow uh, interlude before the real, when the theme comes in. When that comes in, it's this very heavy introduction. Um, first of all, the opening rhythm is what we call um, a French overture, a long note with da dam, ba bam, with two dotted rhythm, um, and this is really um, the the music is fit for when the French kings, right, when when Louis the Fourteenth have any uh, have any uh, public appearances, then the the musicians will play this. I mean, it's kind of majestic feeling, long and then da dam. Um, and, and one thing about French Overture that we can um, r r read about is the French musicians, they never will treat the dotted rhythm like the way it is. Da da, da da, right? One fourth of that beat. They always often um, over dot it. So instead of da da, da da, they always do da da, ba ba. And they are really proud of this tradition. Um, so they, they even mention this in writing. They say, we French, we, we don't play exactly according to the notation, just like we don't pronounce every written word. Um, when, when we really speak of the word, right? We all know uh, uh, restaurant, right? That you don't really pronounce the T because that ending T, you don't pronounce it. Um, so here, um, and this is really my taste, I would overdot the beginning for, for making this more majestic. Instead of... Well, I see beauty, I see reasons. Um, on both ways, but just at this moment, I really prefer the overdotting. Um, and we see this uh, accelerate uh, acceleration in measure three, not of the tempo, but of the phrasing. <laughs> 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 
right? Because before we have one press per measure, now we have two. And the second one, the second uh, new idea, new phrase in third measure almost is like an uh, intrusion. So we thought it's going to end there. students who currently play in this and, and they always fall into this problem after a couple of notes in this right hand solo then they start to ghost play uh, the notes but we it took us really almost four measures to build up until this point this is the high point so far uh, this highest note and it has the highest uh, tension so here we have to really allow our arm and body weight to help the right hand finger to keep this to to stay strong until the end <laughs> Song. I think this is really the inner feeling. It's very gentle. Um, I stop this overdotting because it's not majestic anymore. It's not. Right? That would feel really wrong to my ears. And, and this measure from five to um, six, this is really a classical example of how the composers show their uh, frustration over two choices they don't know which one to take right to be or not to be um, and and it's really within this self struggle it's so sweet and tender and then suddenly fortissimo diminished chords but tuned down right. again and often when this is when I'm teaching my younger students I will often say piano and forte they don't only just mean oh you have to change the volume it's a feeling right it's the piano uh, you have to think of emotions and then the forte maybe it's angry maybe it's something else but then you have to change the overall emotion instead of just the volume um, and here um, the left hand we have this 16th notes chordal uh, progression in the left hand for over four measures and I think this is almost like a, a third party it's outside of this right hand to the between uh, of, uh, two ideas and this is kind of subjectively observing all of this but the most important is to keep the beat okay. and here after four measures you change from 16th notes to an eighth note on major nine, the downbeat of major nine. Why is that significant? Because first of all, in all the Beethoven pieces, in order to show the tech, uh, the uh, rhythmical tension, um, every note you have to really have two sides to show. When do you play? When do you release the note? And here, if the left hand follows the right hand, it would be wrong because right hand has an eighth note with a 30 second tie. So, off. Left hand has to be off a little bit before the right hand uh, solo. And not only the hand, the pedal has to. To show the tension in the rhythm. Okay. Um, the very end of this uh, uh, section, uh, the timing is somehow 
tricky for a lot of the students. Of course, here we don't hesitate. We don't have any ritornuto before the A flat. But on the note A flat, we have a fermata. So there is where we take time. We uh, create more drama. Okay, a lot of students they stop right before that. Here in the main theme, um, left hand this octave, broken octave, this tremolo is really really difficult to master because number one you have a massive amount you have a lot of them you have to play fast and soft so and here this is a really a good example of how i think a lot of people might heard of this the doorknob you have to really like turn your wrist like you're turning a doorknob um, and here you are the broken octave has two sides right the lower note and then the top note um, I think this is one uh, thing that helped me a lot when I play this I don't think of the two sides I don't think of my left hand turning left and right and left and right because it's too many it's too fast and it, it creates tension and it stops me from playing fast so I actually just do one side and then the kind of like the, the, the kickback or the, the, the counter weight will automatically play the other side. So I just think of the bass. But of course you need to have a very, very relaxed wrist. Um, and here, um, after you find this, you gradually adjust the top note into the same volume. This might take days or weeks, but eventually um, this will help you to have these fast and soft and, and with uh, much longer stamina. Um, the right hand here also is quite tricky. Um, this is a great test on the fingertip strings for voicing. And it's also a good test for the interval uh, shapes, the frame. Um, later on, um, after this whole uh, section, when you have again the left hand, uh, it's it's only quarter notes. Um, it's it's the, the, uh, historically speaking, uh, in the Beethoven's time, quarter notes should be a little bit slightly shorter than real quarter notes. So this is also, we have to really be careful on not to hold the last note too long. We, we can't afford to have these um, without following played not as Beethoven's intention because he really, really, um, sort of every single uh, indication really carefully. Um, the second theme here, um, this famous this beautiful melody um, and quite revolutionary uh, technique. Uh, this is probably the hardest part of the piece. Um, number one, um, the word is about two octaves above and then two octaves below. You have a great distance to travel within very fast uh, tempo. The biggest thing that I would say here is that the shape of the phrase is pointing up. We can't afford to have a big accent on the thumb or on the first note of each phrase. Um, I have heard this many, many times in the students or in the, in the auditions they play. Well, I know 
why the cost because you have to travel and then you have no time to prepare the first notes. Um, and, and how do they do that? It requires us to really um, travel even faster and not to land on this note, but already put our fingers there before before we even play. So. And of course, you may argue, oh, this is uh, also a question and answer. Yeah, I think that part is, is uh, quite commonly uh, acknowledged. People think, oh, this is a um, question and answer. But then really, how do we control that first note to a much softer uh, tone? Uh, that is the real difficulty. And after this section, um, and what I often encounter is when students play to have these two middle voices overpowering the real melody, which is in the bass and in the top. Um, unfortunately, the fingering here we have to we cannot avoid using one and two, the strongest fingers. So we really have to learn how to half play this. This is an effect. This is not a, anything, or it's a harmonic filler. The real singing tone is here. And then that singing tone turns into a staccato. And that's a very, very good example of how Beethoven, when you play Beethoven every two measures, every four measures, it's a different mood. It's a different articulation. It's, it's a different way of phrasing it but you have to do all of this within the same tempo. Okay, um, and towards the end, here. The right hand towards the end of the ex expression, uh, the exp uh, ex uh, position, uh, the right hand now has whole notes. significant because very often I, I see students just play maybe louder but they don't play this the way they should they, they just think oh this is louder they still have a very quick attack but we have to think of all of these uh, almost like a vocal music when they sing a long note they prepare long Right? They sing it deeper. So here, um, we can't just stop the motion after we play. We have to prepare the next note like a long note too. If we can prepare the next note while we hold the previous note. Right? It doesn't need to finish this and then you have to start prepare. We prepare. We wouldn't have enough time. Okay, um, I think this episode is uh, much longer than my other uh, episodes. Um, I hope you like the content. Uh, I hope you uh, will subscribe my channel so that when I upload a new video, you will get the first time a notification. Um, thank you so much for. Uh, watching and supporting my channel. Uh, 2020 is really a tough year, but somehow because of the pandemic, because of the lockdown, because of all the tr cancellation on the musical events, I started building this channel and I'm really blessed with um, everyone's support and, and positive feedbacks. Uh, I think I will continue and um, cross fingers the, the pandemic, the virus will uh, be conquered by our us, uh, human race. But then I think I will continue um, doing my channel um, with uh, series after series. Thank you so much for your support, for your watching. I will see you next week.